swimming hole is the world's largest recirculating pool. Fed by the park's own artesian wells, the water is kept refreshingly cool during hot weather. Surrounding the pool are acres of lawns with umbrella tables and contour chairs, although some folks prefer to just rest on the grass under the warm summer sun. The pool is 200 feet wide and 401 feet long, with a water depth ranging from six inches to 10 and a half feet, and its filtration plant could meet the requirements of a city of 200,000. The finest AAU approved equipment is provided for both swimmers and divers. The safety of everyone is fully protected by the watchful attention of a staff of qualified lifeguards who see that tragedy doesn't mar a sun and fun filled day. Dedicated to the younger set, the Land of Oz is a complete amusement park in miniature with miniature prices to match. Once a year with the park closed to the public, Coney plays host to hundreds of delighted orphans from local children's homes. The park is a picnicker's paradise. More than a thousand clean, attractive tables are free for the taking in the shade of forest trees, under the roofs of Coney's pavilions and in the newly developed Riverview Grove, which also offers plenty of cookout grills. All this in addition to rides and games, ball diamonds and athletic field, horseback riding, boating and miniature golf, make Coney Island Cincinnati's favorite place for relaxation, recreation and entertainment. Yet there was an unfortunate side to Coney Island. Like most of America, Coney was caught up in the civil rights movements of the 1950s and early 60s. Throughout its history, the park had discriminated against blacks. After a long series of often tense but generally peaceful confrontations and legal battles, Coney Island finally admitted blacks in 1955, although integration of moonlight gardens and sunlight pool took another six years. Many years later, the park management somewhat sheepishly admitted that their fears of integration had been almost totally groundless and unnecessary. At the close of each season, the park would be sealed up tight for the winter. Rides were secured and, of course, precautions taken against the park's old nemesis, the river. To protect them against floodwaters, the carousel horses were removed and stored in the highest level of Moonlight Gardens. Then work would begin immediately on new rides and attractions for the coming year. To keep the public's interest, there always had to be something new. Yet the idea was not to change too much. Of course, advertising and promotion are a vital part of any successful venture. And Coney Island made excellent use of film, television, and radio to get its message across.
By the early 1960s, Coney Island was all but literally bursting at the seams. In an era when traditional amusement parks around the country were struggling to survive, Coney was packing in record crowds year after year. Throughout the 1960s, special events such as Twins Day and the annual high school band festivals kept the park packed all summer long. By now, three generations of Cincinnatians had enjoyed the park. New rides like the Wild Mouse thrilled park goers, while old favorites like the Lost River kept the crowds coming back. There is no way to guess how many thousands of Cincinnatians got their very first kiss in the darkened tunnels of the Lost River. Of course, some always got more than their fair share. The new interstate highway system was making travel between cities faster and easier than ever before. And although it was still a problem getting out to Coney from downtown, by the 1960s, the park was regularly drawing customers from as far away as Columbus, Dayton, Louisville, and Lexington. Since the 1920s, management of the park had been largely a family affair. And with the death of Edward Schott in 1962, his brother-in-law, Ralph G. Wax, took over as president and general manager. In the 1960s, Wax pumped two and a half million dollars into the park, adding still more rides and attractions. A log flume ride was added, and a new miniature train, the Coney Island and Lake Como Express. The beautiful little engine is a one-third scale model of the famous 424 CP Hunting. The real Huntington was built in New Jersey in 1863 and shipped clear around Cape Horn in a square rigger to pull the first train to Stockton, California. The trackage of Coney's version stretches 4,678 feet into the forbidding Ohio Valley wilderness of 150 years ago. There, passengers see authentic models of Indians wearing authentic costumes what little there is of them, sporting authentic roach hairdos, brandishing authentic weapons. All of this immense detail was meticulously researched by... One can't help wondering how different history might have turned out if Indians 200 years ago had really been armed with authentic bolt-action repeating rifles. Since the opening of the Shooting Star, Coney's other major roller coaster, the Wildcat, had gradually declined in popularity. In 1964, after 39 seasons, the Wildcat was demolished. The mall was lengthened and redesigned to make room for the Swiss Skyride. This also meant relocating some of the park's famed floral beds. Coney Island was justly called one of the most beautiful parks in America and much of the credit was due to the work of landscape superintendent Henry Schwab, who came to the park in the 1920s and remained until his retirement in 1965. Although the park had grown to 165 acres, by the mid-60s there was literally no more room to grow. Since 1925, River Downs had occupied the land to the east. With hills to the north, the river to the south, and plans for an interstate bypass to the west, Coney Island was as big as it was ever going to get. In 1968, Coney Island was sold to Taft Broadcasting of Cincinnati. Ralph Walk stayed on to manage the park, and the only visible change at first was the addition of some colorful characters, courtesy of Taft's connections with Hanna-Barbera cartoons. Although the park was booming, its problems were taking their toll, not the least of which was continued flooding. The 1960s saw a series of floods strike the park, and while none were as bad as the 37 flood, all did their share of damage. Each year it was costing more and more to clean up the mess. Still, for all its problems, Coney Island remained immensely popular. 
With capacity crowds year after year, it was clear that Cincinnati could support a much larger amusement park. It was equally clear that that park could not be Coney Island. By 1970, Taft had come to a momentous decision. It was time to build another park, one with room to grow, more convenient to other cities like Columbus and Dayton, and far away from any major river. Taft purchased 1,600 acres of land off Kings Mills Road north of the city and began planning their new park to be called Kings Island. The company realized that a new park would have a tough time starting as long as a very successful park was nearby. And so, another momentous decision. Coney Island would be closed. Not only closed, but demolished as well. After more than 80 years, Coney Island had become a victim of its own success. Taft announced that Coney would reopen for one last season while the new park was being built. Spring 1971, and Coney Island opened for its 85th and final season. To Taft's credit, the park was to go out in grand style, and Coney's final season was its best ever with two and three quarter million people coming that year. Many thousands came to get a last look at the place that had meant so much to so many for so long. So deep was the public love for Coney that when the park had announced the previous fall that Moonlight Gardens would not reopen for the final season, public outcry convinced management to change their minds. Moonlight Gardens remained open to the end. Throughout the summer, special events commemorating Coney's long history were held. And even many who had not been to the park in recent years flocked there now by the tens of thousands. Yet all the while, far to the north, a huge steel tower was rising out of an open field. For Coney Island, time was running out. So at long last, there came a final day. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Coney Island. In appreciation of your season's patronage, we are happy once again to present our annual fireworks display. All good things must come to an end. So after 85 years of successful operation, Coney Island will close with tonight's operation, September the 6th, 1971. Coney Island has played a part in the lives of several generations. The good times you've enjoyed here and the memories will last a lifetime. Now we must look to the future. A new park, a new home, King's Island. I promise you, it will be more than you could ever dream an amusement park could offer. And now it is time for our final and farewell salute to Coney Island. Now, Mr. Rossi, on with the fireworks.